So in the current year, Sigmarism, the cult of Sigmar, seems to be a pretty good influence on the Empire. It has been formed into a national religion, and I mean that as in the religion of a nation, the, the embodiment of a nation. Sigmar has essentially become a mix of Jesus, uh, Romulus, and Charlemagne, and they've used that to create a religion. You know, he didn't have to be the Jesus as well as the Charlemagne and the Romulus, but he's been formed into that. Ro I guess Romulus did essentially become a god. In the official myth, they are the sons... Romulus and Remus are the sons of Mars. So, you know, they have been deified to some extent. I'm sure people did basically worship Romulus in Rome, at least at some point, and some people. So, yeah, this is not that strange. But of course, the problem is that it is essentially based on a lie. Sigmar didn't claim to be a deity at any point, so the worry is that this has been co-opted by elites to get power, and it is getting them a lot of power right now whether that was the original intention or not. So, what has to be watched out for is whether this will just become further and further from the values of Sigmar himself as time goes on and as what becomes beneficial to the elites changes. Perhaps this will just become a sort of herd religion <laughs> and it will be taken away from the sort of individualistic warrior values of Ulrich and morphed further and further into this just sort of universalist peaceful religion. As the bloody elites begin to impose a communist theocracy upon the people of the Empire. But that's for another time period and the end times are probably going to come before then. But uh, I thought I'd leave you with a little extract from uh, Nietzsche's The Antichrist, which could also be uh, translated as the anti-christian so don't it's not necessarily blasphemy it's not it's not satanism anyway if you're very religious about christianity maybe don't listen to it it'll piss you off a little bit but it's not he's not critiquing uh, god per se he's more it's a theological attack on christianity but it is an attack on christianity so if if you don't like that and you you know that's going to piss you off don't listen to it i'm not even saying Christianity is wrong. If you are a Christian and you listen to this, don't don't think that I'm trying to convince you to not be a Christian. I would say it's more about him critiquing how Christianity has changed over time, because I'm sure this isn't how... I'm sure his criticisms of this religion now haven't been valid throughout the whole of history. But anyway, if you enjoy the passage, you should listen to the rest of it. Um, it's on Audible or read it free off the internet, I'll link the website. The guy writes in the most alpha male way ever. He's always sort of asserting his beliefs. It's quite refreshing to uh, read someone who knows what he thinks and he's just gonna say it, you know what I mean? He's thought about it for enough and he's just gonna say it like fully one-sided, which is actually very enjoyable. And obviously he's very intelligent, very good vocabulary, so it flows nicely, it's a nice. It's a nice read, in my opinion. And he's very much not your fedora-tipping atheist. He goes into the morals of the theology. He's not just saying, Yeah, but you can't prove that God exists or not, so why sh- A criticism of the Christian concept of God leads inevitably to the same conclusion. A nation that still believes in itself holds fast to its own God. In him, it does honor to the conditions which enable it to survive. To its virtues, it projects its joy in itself, its feeling of power, into a being to whom one may offer thanks. He who is rich will give of his riches. A proud people need a god to whom they can make sacrifices. Religion within these limits is a form of gratitude. A man is grateful for his own existence. To that end, he needs a god. Such a god must be able to work both benefits and injuries. He must be able to play either friend or foe, and he is wondered at for the good that he does, as well as for the evil that he does. But the castration against all nature of such a god, making him a god of goodness alone, could be contrary to human inclination. Mankind has just as much need for an evil god as for a good god. It doesn't have to thank mere tolerance and humanitarianism for its own existence. 
What would be the value of a god who knew nothing of anger, revenge, envy, scorn, cunning and violence? Who had perhaps never experienced the rapturous ardours of victory and of destruction? No one would understand such a god. Why would anyone want him? True enough, when a nation is on the downward path, when it feels its belief in its own future, its hope of freedom slipping from it, when it begins to see submission as the first necessity, and the virtues of submission as measures of self-preservation, then it must overhaul its god. He then becomes a hypocrite, timorous and demure. He counsels peace of soul, hate no more, leniency and love of friend and foe. He moralizes endlessly. He creeps into every private virtue. He becomes the god of every man. He becomes the private citizen, a cosmopolitan. Formerly, he represented a people, the strength of a people, everything aggressive and thirsty for power in the soul of a people. And now, he is simply the good god. The truth is that there is no alternative for gods. Either they are the will to power, in which case they are national gods, or the incapacity to power, in which case they have to be good.